Guys, can we have a round of applause for our second guest speaker, which is Ben Cohn of Taxi Box. Thank you very much, Ben. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Ben. So, Ben is co-founder of Taxi Box, a mobile self-storage box in Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney, delivered right to your door. You pack it and they collect it and store it for you. Ben hatched the idea in 2010 after traveling to the US and hearing of a similar business in New Jersey. So, Ben, how did, yeah, how did you get started initially then in 2010? Um, I think at the time I was working for a consulting company, so I kind of followed a pretty corporate path um, out of university. I was working at a company called Accenture, and I was actually sent to New York for work for a bit. And uh, yeah, went out with mates and sort of saw the concept around in the US and thought something that had to work. And uh, I always kind of knew I was going to do my own thing eventually, so yeah. just took a punt, left work, and said, I'm just doing this. Yeah. So it was, was great. Cool. And what were some of those kind of hurdles in the initial stages? Um, well, I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't know. I, I think as a personality, I've always kind of had a fair bit of faith in myself. Um, actually, the, the story is, to, to be fully correct with it, I ended up um, quitting my job about six months to a year before that to go buy property. And I renovated a property for about a year, and I did really well from that, and I just decided to sell that. And then I sold that and I had um, a fair bit of cash saved up. Um, and I um, actually went to, I've got a business partner in the business who I, I met at, at, in consulting and we set, decided to set up the business together. So that, I mean, the hurdles were realistically, um, I, I really wanted to make this business um, fairly unique from the start. And I knew that one of the biggest issues in the business was the capital costs. Because for us, um, actually, as Ben, as you mentioned, capital costs are a big thing. We had to basically buy all of our taxi boxes, which are the storage units. And so the biggest hurdle was finding a creative way to buy them at a really good price. And so we spent months in China, actually, um, finding, finding factories and basically manufacturing these, these boxes overseas. So capital was a constraint at the start. Um, we borrowed. I had some money saved up, uh, borrowed from family. And um, yeah, the rest was just actually I hate to say it because it was just actually a lot of fun. Like mm. the experience was great, traveling around China, meeting factories, being 25 years old, kind of acting like we knew what we were doing, um, working out of backpackers. Uh, we designed the covers. The, the taxi box cover that you see driving around today was designed into backpackers by myself uh, when I was 25 uh, on the Illustrator. Um, it just kind of all just worked. I don't know. It was just a good experience. And was there a catalyst when you left Accenture? Obviously, you said you wanted to work for yourself, but was there a, mo a, a moment which was a tipping point for you? Yeah, the decision to leave Accenture was, was really the decision to go into property. I think at the, at the time it was property. I had an opportunity to buy a place at a really good price, and I did that, and I really wanted to renovate it myself. And so I sort of spent this six-month period. Uh, in the end, it was eight months by the time I sold it, just renovating, and that was kind of my first train of thought. I wanted to get out of, out of the corporate world. Uh, and then I went traveling around the, uh, around the, year, around the world for a year, came back, and I, and I wanted to do something. And then I uh, remember you know, I'd seen the concept in the US. We were like, let's just set this business up in Australia. No one was doing it. Cool. And we were having a bit of a chat beforehand, and you've got quite a positive mindset. Is that something that was always assisting you in those early stages? Yeah. I don't know. Like, I, again, it's kind of cliche, but the truth is I literally didn't doubt what, we, what, what, we, what, what I was doing. Like, I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to start this up. It was a really tangible business. So I think maybe one of the differences is that I knew that there was a need for storage. Um, people need storage. That was like a very basic thing for me. I knew I was doing something really different. Um, and it was going to, it was storage, but in a really cool, funky way, because the storage unit comes out to your front door. And so I kind of always along the way, I knew this was going to be, this was going to work, it was going to be big. I just really somehow didn't doubt myself. I used to come home go to sleep, I was dead tired, and every day I just would go back into it and it just kept growing, I guess. And after what Ben said in that first talk, mm. how much research did you do? The one week, the three months, what was it? Yeah, um, well we spent, we spent three months in, in, in China having a lot of fun and just meeting, going to fat, from factory to factory, looking for someone to manufacture the product for us. Um, and then, I mean, I know nothing about, or oh, at the time, you know, I didn't know anything about trucks or forklifts or warehouses. Uh, I had to get my forklift license, so that was something that was unique. So there was a bunch of researching of the industry of things that we just didn't know. But I just found that, um, well, actually, going back to the point of, of how, how much research you do, we probably spent th 
three, four, five months, realistically, uh, researching the United States market, because um, the, the, the industry is massive over there, seeing what they've done over there. And then, um, yeah, and then just like baby steps along the way. There was never one major, nothing in the last seven years that we've been running has been one major step. Everything's been tiny, tiny steps. It's just you can't even wake up. Like I was, I was reflecting on this a moment ago that I was, uh, you know, for, for some of you that are sort of in your mid-20s, I was there six, seven years ago in the exact same position. Uh, and I, it just, it's amazing. I just suddenly wake up and I look and I'm, you know, I'm running a business. And, but it's, everything's just been incremental steps along the way. It hasn't been this monumentous shift, this epiphany that happened to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And Ben's analogy of the seesaw as well and that tipping point of becoming cash flow positive. Yeah. Do you remember that moment for yourself as well? Yeah. We became cash flow positive probably within or break even probably six months to a year into the business. Um, we didn't take out a salary for the first year and a half. It was just myself and my business partner for the first year and a half doing all the work. Um, and then from there, it just, yeah, it gradually grew. And again, you kind of just wake up and suddenly it's like, oh my God, like, oh my, God my business is making a fair bit of money. Um, it was a unique experience. Um, I would say though that I don't think that it gets, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like it gets easier and easier with time. Um, the, actually, if, if I can just touch on that a bit more, mm -hmm. the first year and a half or two years was actually quite easy for me because I just knew I had to work really hard and it was just dependent on myself and my business partner. But um, as the business grows, uh, we've got staff, we operate in three cities, we've got 49 full-time team members. Um, with that there, you've got, um, you know, as humans, uh, people have things that happen in their lives. You kind of carry a lot of that load. And so the interpersonal stuff that happens with dealing with people and dynamics at work, that I actually find that's really challenging. It's, it's, a, it's a complex decision. You know, trucks breaking down. Uh, we've got a fleet of trucks that, you know, they have accidents or they break down and they need servicing. It's just stuff that you never thought about. So for me, as time goes on, um, it, the, the odds and the stakes are much, much higher than they were. Um, I f still find ways to really challenge myself and enjoy things, but I don't, th to be frank, I don't find that it gets easier with time. We, do, we probably make more money, that's true, but the emotional uh, drain is pretty heavy in running a business. Yeah, so the challenges are different now to what they were in the initial stages. So if you, know, if you could go back in those early stages, is there anything that you would do different? Or is there anything you'd tell yourself now? I'm really terrible at this. I, 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 we were talking about this before. I, I always see the positive in life. I really, uh, and my business partner is probably better at saying, no, we should have done this differently and that differently. I'm always like, yeah, it's good. It's all going to be fine. Um, I can think of one thing that we did that um, was crucial, um, and that's really process documenting everything from the start and having really rigid processes having a process map for everything, really defining what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, that was important. But things that we could, so can you, can you ask a question again yeah, to make you sure could I'm do something, If you could yeah. do something different, if you could go back and tell yourself one thing to be able to obviously benefit these days, what would it be? There's a question around whether we should have raised money. So, and I'm sure when you guys all go out and start businesses, um, it's kind of an attractive proposition to have someone come to you and say, hey, we want to give you X amount of money to buy 20 or 30% of your business. Um, we had that along the way, uh, to be honest, multiple times. And we got really close to raising money in the business at one stage and got to a term sheet. And uh, I was looking at this and I was thinking to myself, these guys want to control how much money we're taking out of the business, which was Fair enough, like if you're an investor, that's, that's something that's gonna happen. We decided, and, and in the end, I, we pulled a pin in it because I was like, I want the freedom. So the, the one thing that I might have done, done differently is that definitely slowed down the growth of the business. Uh, and um, it's kind of a challenge that sometimes people raise money, it really accelerates growth, but it takes away your freedom. We picked the freedom path, freedom, mm -hmm. um, but, a much slower, but it was definitely a slower path. Uh, and we've grown organically without raising money the banks have given us debt, so we've raised debt from the banks, but it hasn't been uh, the magnitude that we could have raised. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
And then thinking about the pressures of debt as well, and obviously you talked about the employees you have and <laughs> you're faced with those people day to day on the, the warehouse floor and things like that. Yeah. So how do you manage those relationships on a day to day basis when you have those people coming to you, you know, things are happening in their lives? So you, no, well, not, not, not debt, you're referring to But yeah, just like if you've got obviously the stresses of debt and obviously yeah. you have people, you know, they're paying their mortgage and things like that. Yeah. It's like how are you managing the stresses of that on a day to day basis? Um, it's, that really is, is a hard thing. I, by nature, I, I, try, I really try to have empathy and I, I genuinely care about every person that's in our business. Mm -hmm. And so I engage in conversation with them and I'm, quite, I'm kind of there. Um, I'm not the sort of person that sits up in the office and doesn't, doesn't talk to anyone. Um, and so um, that's actually partic it's particularly challenging. Um, it's also challenging if you're having to, uh, you know, you want to be nice to everyone and you want everyone to like you. Uh, but sometimes you have to, you know, move people on or disciplinary actions towards various staff if you need to. And, and again, that's just another, another challenge. So how do I overcome that? How do I deal with it? Um, it's just sometimes you have to suck it up, bite the bullet, and just realize that if you don't do it, you're actually really damaging your business. Um, and it's actually unfair to the other staff members if you don't deal with, with you know, if, when it comes to disciplinary stuff, you've, got to, you've just got to do it as hard as it is. Um, the emotional stuff that staff members lay on you, you just carry it. Like as a business owner, you just carry it and you go home to your wife or your friends and then that's your outlet. But um, when you're at work, you've got your, your game face on the whole time, you're positive, you maintain that, that sort of um, really clean professional approach, you don't lose your cool and you, found, you find outlets outside of work um, to deal with it. And then from a leadership perspective, how do you nurture your own leadership skills? Is there any resources or people that you lean on specifically for that? Yeah, that's a really good question. It sounds really, really a bit odd, but I think that a lot of the best stuff that comes to me creatively in my mind um, or my views on the business is when I'm really on my own. Um, I sometimes, I've been known to go and hire a cabin over in Hillsville and I just go there on my own for two days and I just literally spend time reading and just thinking and that gives me some great ideas for the business. Um, in terms of leadership, uh, both Ben and I are part of, of EO, which is a, a business group um, which is fantastic. Um, and I think as a leader it's really important that you're in touch with your human side. So. Have, you need to have empathy and I think it's important that you as a leader have vulnerability and sometimes you can show that vulnerability to your team around you. It's just got to be managed. Um, if, you're, if you've got your, um, I don't know, if you're not showing humanity or your true self, um, it's kind of, you lose trust I think with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And thinking of like the future for Taxi Box, yep. what are the plans? Obviously, are you looking to branch out further afield from obviously the three cities that you're in here in Australia? Um, the market's really big. So we, in terms of market capitalization, we, we've only taken a very small, currently a very small part of the, of the self-storage market. Um, we're expanding really aggressively um, in terms of um, our core operations. So um, we've got developers. I mean, our business is becoming effectively a tech play. So we've got software engineers that are building really incredible apps that you would never expect in the storage industry. Um, we've recently bought a self-storage business um, and we're now rolling out traditional self-storage in conjunction with mobile. We want to build out um, like co-working spaces for industrial users. So we actually want to turn warehouses into working spaces where you can have like a, 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 a garage shed but upstairs is like a working space. So you can have um, a really funky storage center out of it. So we're trying to basically branch out taxi box as a mobile business in, into other storage areas, which are less so about storage, but it comes as a concept of space um, that we need in our lives, basically, whether it's mobile or local or uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. Yeah, cool. um, yeah but just investing heavily in, in the expansion of the core business, uh, sorry, in the expansion of the core business and all these other areas. Yeah, excellent. And in terms of, um, you know, the, the relationships in your life. Has there only been any times where, you know, it's affected obviously your marriage and things like that? Has it got too much fear? Has there been any points where you thought, this is enough for me, I want to give up and walk away? In the business? Yeah. 
it is an absolute lie if a business owner tells you that they haven't thought of it because every business owner goes through this and has these days where they're like, oh my God, this is just horrific. Uh, so it happens. Um, I definitely have thought of that. Um, I never really got close to really acting on it, to be honest. Like as much as I've thought of it, if someone said to me, hey, I'm gonna buy a business, um, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't do it because I, I really love what I'm doing at the moment. But I've definitely, you know, there's tough times. Uh, and then the impact on relationships. Yeah. If my wife was sitting here, uh, she would tell you that it's had a massive impact on things. Um, I come home and I, and I share things with her that she doesn't want to hear about. Um, she can't stand you know, the, the, the word taxi box anymore, but um, <laughs> she married anymore. me, so <laughs> she stuck with it, to be honest. Um, um, yeah, I, actually, one thing is, my, as a personality, I, I like to be fairly relaxed. Um, I do find though that um, in running a business and having staff that sort of, uh, I guess, report to you, I've almost become a bit, um, like in my conversations are very much, I'm really focusing on everything they're saying and I'm just very engaged and I find that happening in my social life as well. Um, and people are like, bro, I feel like I'm being interviewed. I'm like, yeah, man, I just need the information. Just tell me and we can act on it, you know? So, yeah. Awesome. And if you're thinking a bit further afield, obviously you can capture more of that market that's still untouched. Mm -hmm. Do you um, have an exit plan? Does every founder have an exit plan, do you think? Do you have one eventually down the line? That is a really good point. Um, when we started our business, we did not think of an exit plan at all. Um, and that um, really shaped the way we've grown our business. So going back to one of the points you asked a minute before, I think actually starting the business with a view as to who will eventually buy that business or what industry is going to buy that business is a really important point um, because it actually shapes the way you're going to develop that business to eventually have a buyer. Um, we didn't do that and we've created an incredibly unique business that whilst it is very sellable to people at the moment, it's not built by us to sell. So I actually don't have any desires to sell the business for the long term. Um, I've got, I can see the view of how big the market can be. Um, I'm doing things that creatively really challenge me in the business. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily driven by money as much as um, challenging myself creatively or doing things that are really different or challenging the status quo. So in this business, I've got plenty of scope to be able to do that. Yeah, and what does drive you then? So what are some of those things? Yeah, so I just love I love shocking the customer's experience. So people think storage, they're like, man, it's storage, who cares, it's so boring. But when you book a taxi box, um, along the way, you get jolted by these random things that just come out of the blue. So for example, the, the taxi box starts talking to you on emails and just starts having an affair with you. Um, if you get a quote on our website um, and you actually get the quote email to yourself, you can click a random button that's, there's a Mario Kart Mario character there, you press a button and it goes into this full Tetris game, oh, we can't say Tetris, and a, a Tetris lookalike game where you play and depending on your score, you actually get discounts off your taxi box. Wow. So it lures you back into the process um, and our business is absolutely littered with surprises along the way. That's the stuff that just absolutely um, I love and people book a taxi box and like, man, I was getting storage and holy crap, I'm never going to any other storage company again because the experience was completely, radically different. Um, I can talk about the stuff for hours. Our business is just filled with these things. And is that, are they the kind of ideas that you pick up when you're in this cabin in Healesville? Yeah. Is that the, is it not the more operational strategic yeah. side, but more of these creative Mario type things, right? Yeah, 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 yeah it's true. Um, it actually happens over weird dinners with friends where they're like, man, you should do something. And I'm like, we're doing it. We're yeah. just going to do it. Um, yeah, these, these ideas come out of uh, really random places. When I'm <coughs> overseas, traveling, friends, um, the team around me, sort of I feel like they've really, they, are, they kind of feel the culture mm -hmm. and they've started suggesting things that normally most, I think, um, it feels weird saying bosses, but mo most bosses would be like, there's no chance we're doing that. We're kind of like, let's just try it. Yeah. Let's just see. So it's kind of similar to Ben's concept of you know, if it costs less than $5,000, why not do it? Um, you're going to get nowhere if you do, from my perspective, if you do something like everyone else, um, you've got to find an edge. 
you either got to be really good at it, you've either got to have a hell of a lot of money. Um, but for me, far easier is to actually use your brain to think of, of doing things in creative ways that um, people are just not thinking about, that corporates that are focused on money aren't necessarily engaging their minds in. You know, that gives you a unique edge. So obviously you're very customer focused. Yep. Do you have a certain set of values at Taxi Box that you kind of always adhere to? And is everybody, every staff member adhering to those? Yeah, so um, I, they talk about business values, core values and businesses, which... Uh, it, it crops up quite often, so yeah, yeah, it's good to get everybody's take on this one. I'll share with you my experience on business core values. I've resisted this for years and years and years because I think of these, this comment of these are my core values of my business and then you put it up on the wall and no one really looks at it. Um, and people use words like trust, integrity, honesty. I'm like, come on, that is so not unique to you. So uh, we went through a really large process of coming up with values that were actually organic to us. Um, and I will share them with you very quickly. Um, but uh, the one for us that we came up with was um, open TB, no BS. So open taxi box and no bullshit, which is we're a business where um, if you need to raise something, you raise it. But um, I don't want bullshit from anyone. I don't want politics in the office. I don't want people um, that are not sort of, you know, they're, they're ruining the dynamic. So it's open TB, no BS. We've got um, chase the goat, which is chase the greatest of all taxi boxes. Um, and that is basically um, just doing what we said we're going to do um, to our customers, never letting them down, so being really accountable. And then the last one is um, remarkable deliveries. So the way we see it is that we want to deliver a remarkable experience. It's not good enough for it to be exceptional. It's not good enough for it to be good or great. It's got to be remarkable so that when they're left, the experience is like, wow, that was just Freaking cool. Yeah. And also, are you, are you a good salesman? In those early days, were you selling then? Like how's, how's your sales skills after what Ben was saying? Ben, that was a really interesting point. I enjoyed that. I reckon by nature, I'm very good at sales. Um, I just have never really had to sell in my business. Um, the reason, I, I guess I've had to sell in negotiating with uh, landlords or purchasing properties or um, actually the negotiation sales is something that's inevitable in a whole bunch of parts of the business, but not um, for us. Direct sales to customers was, is something that we've always had staff effectively doing. So I've got a, you know, we've got a call center with sales staff that do all the selling. Um, at the start, I was on the phones doing sales. I think I did pretty well at that, but um, I just haven't had the chance to really engage in that much. Um, but I agree, it's, it's important. I would add one other element. I, I actually feel that, um, I was looking at Ben's slide around the four things that you need. I think it was sales, processes, um, finance. finance. Was it, those are the three. And um, it was interesting, interesting for us, marketing is a massive point of our business. So, and, and I guess for you, it was sales and marketing. Depends, if you're a, a business to consumer sort of business, you really need strong marketing skills. If you're a business to business, uh, B2B business, you, you need probably less marketing skills. But for us, uh, for me, my, one of my big strengths is, is having a strong marketing background. Well, marketing flair, I guess, around. Okay, excellent. Guys, we're going to leave it there now. So thank you very much, Ben. Guys, can we have a round of applause for Ben Cohen of Taxi Box? <laughs> awesome, Ben. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.